I've been doing a little bit of research uh, on bulletin bloopers. God bless church secretaries. They, they have very often an unthankful job, but often church secretaries don't check for typos sometimes before they print things in a bulletin. It ends up being pretty hilarious. Here's one. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a good chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> Somebody should have said, we need to switch the wording on that. Here's one more. Low esteem support group will meet Thursday, 7 p.m. Please use the back door. <laughs> All right. Today we're going to take up where we left off last week in our subject, what the Bible has to say about angels. We covered quite a bit of ground last week, and we're going to uh, cover hopefully a lot of ground today as well. We're going to begin with our text that we have used as our foundation text that is found in Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 13 and 14. And this is the writer of Hebrews who, um, there has, whom there has been much discussion and debate in theological circles and biblical uh, studies circles as to who the writer of Hebrews was. It'll be interesting to find out when we get to heaven who that was. We can finally settle that. Uh, many think it was Paul. Others think it was um, other individuals. I don't want to waste time talking about it. But any, at any rate, the writer to the Hebrews said, To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Again, that is written in such a manner as to presuppose that there is already inherent knowledge in the reader. A knowledge that angels are real, a knowledge as to uh, their, their, not only their nature, or their reality, but their nature. And just pointing out something, it is almost as if the writer to Hebrews is pointing out something, pointing out something that um, will just reinforce what they already know. And so today we're going to make that assumption, although that assumption can't be made today. Uh, many people don't believe in angels. In fact, the enlightened group, those that intellectually enlightened and the elites, uh, would laugh at such a notion. But I do believe that in these last days, things are becoming so apparent that, that the veil between this world and the next world, the veil between those realities is thinning. And so even individuals who may not have prior to believed in supernatural are having to reconsider because it's almost becoming irrefutable. And so today we're going to jump right into this. We, we left off at the fact that the Bible tells us that angels are personal. Now what does that mean? It means that they are individual beings. Uh, they're not to be understood merely as impersonal forces. They're not robotic. They're, they're not some, some type of a being that God just orders to say a certain thing, act a certain way, deliver a message. Again, I think perhaps the best way to say that is they're not AI, they're not robotic, they are actual individual beings. Now, how do we know this? How can we reinforce this? Anytime we say something, we need to make sure that we have biblical grounds for that statement. Well, one of the ways that we know that they're personal beings is they have personal names. We find incidences in the Bible where angels have given their names, as you and I. Uh, there is something, isn't it, isn't it something that we just take for granted that it, is, that, that it is normal for us to name a human being that comes into the world? We just take that for granted. They need, we'll say, they need a name. Same must apply to angels. Because we find in the scriptures, in Daniel, the 8th chapter, 16, uh, 8 and 9, chapters 8 and 9, and then Luke 1, we find references to primarily the predominant names that we see 
are Gabriel and Michael, Daniel the 12th chapter, verse 1, the great prince who protects his people. From that statement, it is believed that the archangel, Michael is referred to as an archangel. We will get into orders and levels of angels in another teaching, but there are certain levels of angels. There's, there's a difference in not only assignment and role, but there's a difference in, in authority, evidently, and in power and in responsibilities. So there are orders of angels, there are organizations. Angels are organized much as we would organize a government here on earth or much as we would organize an army here on earth. And we didn't come up with the idea. God, God had the organization before we did. So if anybody got the idea from anyone, we got the idea from God. So they are organized. But Michael is called an archangel. Our understanding from the scriptures is that this is one of the highest, if not the highest order of angel. He would be considered perhaps a five-star general. And Michael is the protector of Israel. We find that mentioned in Revelation, the, the, uh, in, in Daniel, excuse me, 12.1. Michael is the great prince referred to by the other angel that came to speak to Daniel. So the other angel that addressed Daniel said that Michael, and then again he makes a statement uh, as if this is something accepted, the great prince who protects your people. Just a matter of fact, Michael's the great prince who protects your people, the people of Israel. And in Jude 9, it refers to the archangel Michael. So, so we have a couple of names of angels. And so they have persons, they have personal names. They are personal, they are individual beings. They have intelligence. Uh, the Bible tells us, and gives a great example of this in Daniel, the 11th chapter and the 12th chapter. Sometime if you have time, I'm always incredibly impressed with the knowledge of the angel in Daniel 11 and 12. He begins to speak extemporaneously and explain to Daniel in great detail what is going to happen over the span of hundreds and hundreds of years. So this is an exhibition of great intelligence. Angels, to a certain degree, are aware of what's going to come. They are aware of God's plan. And it is incredible. As you read it, uh, there is such detail, then this person will, this will happen, and then there'll be a coup, and this, they will take over, and then this person will be put in place, he will reign for this many years, and then he will die, and then this person, it goes on and on and on. So angels have intelligence. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they're individual beings. They have knowledge, but they also can carry on conversation. So, for example, we have examples of that. They're conversational. We have examples of that when they talk with Abraham, Abraham and his three visitors. Abraham calls them three men. They're angels, but they're conversational. Recognize that, that angels have the ability to sit around a fire and carry on a conversation. They're, they're, they're not pre-programmed. They can respond. They, they interact. And so they're conversational. Gabriel spoke at length with Daniel, with Zechariah, and with Mary. Da Gabriel spoke as an individual being, just like you and I would speak, but with far greater knowledge and intelligence, back and forth to converse. So that's an indication that they are personal. And then there is also the um, inference that they are continuing to learn. Of course, they don't know everything. Only God knows everything. And so they're, they're continuing to gain knowledge and they have a desire to learn. And this is found in Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 9 and 10 where the writer, Paul, says to the Ephesians, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now, interesting, not hitherto, not in the past, Paul says that now, in the present time, that wisdom is being made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. That's, that's a reference to the organizational and the order of angelic beings. And so Paul is saying that there is still a lesson going on. 
And in another place it says, we talked about the fact that the angels have a desire to look into the, these things of salvation. So they're, they're inquisitive. They're, in, they're, they're individual beings. They can carry on conversation. They have knowledge and intelligence. They're conversational, like I said. And they're inquisitive and evidently they're still learning. So they are a different order of creation than we are. But they are individual. The Bible tells us that um, they have emotions. They experience emotions. And this is expressed in Job and in Luke and the book of Revelation, Old and New Testament alike. One of the emotions that is predominant that they express and is even specifically mentioned is it says they rejoiced, the angels rejoiced to see God laying the foundation of the earth. Interesting. And it says in Luke 15.10, one of the most famous verses that many of us have heard is they rejoice I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So they feel joy. They have emotions. And, and notice what they're joyful about. They evidently, other than knowledge that is imparted to us within our spirit, our, brains, our brain has to catch up. I heard one theologian say that our brain comes along like a, our brain follows our heart, the knowledge of our heart, like a little puppy dog on a leash. Our brain has to catch up with what our heart knows. May this, mind, may this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. That is not an instantaneous endowment of mind. That is something we learn. We learn that through the renewing of our mind. And so this, this knowledge, this becoming like Christ in our mind is a process. But our heart knows some things and evidently angels have a greater understanding, I would assume, than we do over what re is really transpiring. Why wouldn't they? They saw Jesus crucified. They knew what was going on behind the scenes when he was dead. They saw him raised from the dead. They saw everything. They saw behind the scenes where even the disciples only saw what was apparent here on earth until, unless God opened their eyes, right? But the angels saw everything that was going on. They saw the magnitude of the battle. They saw what Jesus really went through to redeem mankind. They, they know. And so when one sinner repents, they say, victory. Another victory for Jesus. Another victory for the kingdom. Another person that has received. So they rejoice. They feel joy. It says that they will rejoice at the marriage supper of the Lamb when that takes place. It's interesting that they will not be seated with the Lord, only the redeemed. It's an incredible privilege what you and I have received. The position that God has given us is incredible in that the angels, who have evidently superior knowledge to us, um, superior power, as we will talk about, will evidently stand and rejoice when we are seated with the Savior, our Savior at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's incredible. So, we, we know that if they rejoice, and I've got to get back, I started at the wrong place in my notes, but if they rejoice, then they, I, I will say, and it's not anywhere up here, that if it only stands to reason if they have joy, <clears throat> and they have a full range of mo emotions that they also could experience um, irritation. You say, well, that, that would be sinful. No, the Bible says be angry and sin not. The Bible says that Jesus was angry and drove the money changers out of the temple. So anger is, is an emotion that God has given to us and is useful at times. I'm, I, was going to, I was going to go into a little bit of marriage and, and meddling, so I'm not going to go there. We don't have time. <clears throat> but, but, you know, we have, we have, and I will bring this up, well, I should have brought it up, that in their communication, well, I will bring it up in a few moments. I'll, I will get there. 
And so we know that we know that they are they can carry on a conversation. Let me give you a modern day example of this. Let's see if I can get there quickly. I received this from Cindy. My wife received this from Cindy Ridzone, who attends the church. And she has given me permission to share this with you. We talk about the fact and we have talked about incidences and, and um, events in the Bible, illustrations of angels appearing. There is an occasion in the scripture where it says that we may have, it is possible for us to entertain angels unaware, that we may not even know that we have interacted with an angel because they can take on human form. They can uh, be undercover agents, so to speak, for God. I'm watching Pastor's Sunday School lesson from last week on angels and have a story to share. My father took ill, ended up at UPMC in Pittsburgh. As soon as we arrived, there was a lady who said her name was Jamie. She was a physician assistant. She told us her job was to go, be a go-between for dad and the doctors. She would brush my dad's arm and said, Mr. Stuckey, I am here to take care of you. Don't be afraid, no matter what happens, you're going to be okay because God is taking care of you and he is protecting you. We thought, oh, how sweet. This continued for four days. She would come in and lovingly and caringly tell dad that God was taking care of him. There was a male nurse, Sean. He did and said the same thing. God loves you and is taking care of you. Eventually, Dad's health declined and he had to be moved to another floor. When we got the news he was terminal, my sister and I went back to the previous floor to thank Jamie and Sean for their kindness and love. We got to the floor and everyone that we had seen for several days were there, but there was someone else sitting where Jamie had sat. We spoke to Jennifer, who we had seen all week, and asked for Jamie and Sean. She recognized us, but said there was no one there by those names or matched their description. The lady sitting at Jamie's desk is the only physician assistant on the floor, and no male nurses serve on that floor at all. We knew instantly we had witnessed angels caring for dad and for us all week. We felt such peace and love. They didn't glow or float around. They took on human form, but the people on the floor didn't see them and they did not stand out to our other siblings. Our siblings were like, what are you talking about? There were so many people who came in and out, why would you remember them? But my sister and I are the only Christians in our family, and we knew we had experienced angels caring for our father. Isn't that awesome? Let me get back to my timer. All right. So we've talked about they have emotions. Let's keep moving. <clears throat> they have limited decision-making authority. We know that from the interactions that we see in the scripture. I say limited because obviously they are obedient to and subject to the authority and almighty God. They serve God. And every action they take must conform to his will. However, there must be a certain amount of latitude given to them in carrying out their assignments. Now, why do I say that? Let's look at Luke, the first chapter, verses 18 through 20. This is a recording of the interaction that took place between a priest named Zechariah and his wife, who was named Elizabeth, and a messenger angel named Gabriel. And Gabriel is talking to Zechariah. Gabriel has a message for him. And the message is that Elizabeth will become pregnant. Zechariah, <clears throat> excuse me, Zechariah, let's interrupt the conversation and, and, and let's see what Zechariah's response is. And then the angel's response. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. <clears throat> now listen to the response of Gabriel. I am Gabriel. I'm going to try to read it like he meant it. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and tell you the good news. And now you will be silent 
and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an irritated angel. <laughs> now, <clears throat> some of you may ask, and there's been discussion, Mary asked almost essentially the same thing. Mary said, how can this be? Because I, am, I have not known any man, I'm a virgin. And it is, it is probable, they believe, that Mary, Mary might have been 14 years of age or so. And the angel is very kind to her. The angel says, the Holy Spirit will come over you, and this will happen, and that will happen. But Gabriel's irritated with Zechariah. Why is that? Because Zechariah's response was unbelief in the face of experience and knowledge. Mary's response was innocent ignorance on how in the world will this work. Hers was not, hers was not a question of unbelief. Zechariah should have known better. He was a priest. He served in the temple. Mary's a young little maiden in an isolated village who is innocent and in saying, I just don't understand. So by this, we see that angels can evidently, I'll use the word, get irritated. Another example of this is at Sodom and Gomorrah. When the angels went to visit Lot, do you recall that? In Genesis 19, 10, and 11, <clears throat> excuse me, the angels come to see and really rescue Lot out of Sodom. And it says that, that um, perverse men heard that there were two men. Obviously, the angels had taken on the appearance of men. The perverse men looking for more partners um, came to the door of Lot and made improper approaches to them. They wanted to have sex with them. And um, the Bible says, but the men inside, that would be the angels, reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness. So they could not find the door. There is evidence of decision-making authority. The angels responded to a situation and evidently have authority to make certain decisions within, again, the parameters of God and His will. And so that leads me to the question, and obviously you, you know by the verses I've shared with you, that I believe it answers it. If angels can feel joy, then they are, are they capable of other emotions as well? And the answer to that, I believe, would be yes. So angels are personal. They're individuals. They are beings. Like a human being, they are beings. And then we need to keep moving. They are immortal. Now by immortal, I differentiate that from eternal. Eternal, uh, eternal would be God. God has always been and will always be. Angels had a beginning. As we covered in the first lesson, they were created by God. They are beings that were created by God at a point evidently prior to the creation of this earth and universe, because as I just read to you in Job, they rejoiced at the laying of the foundation of the world. So they were already in existence. However, they will never die. Angels are immortal. Uh, they are spirits, which is one reason they will never die. And we know that because of that, God has prepared a place for those who rebelled in heaven against him where they will be held and punished forever and that is hell the Bible tells us that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels so they are eternal they will never die and then Jesus specifically emphasized this in Luke the 20th chapter verse 36 he said neither can they die anymore for they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection Neither can they die anymore, for they are like angels. So they are immortal. We're going to move on. The second major point that we want to make, and I'm going to do the little snazzy flip here. Am I going too fast? Am I... Are we covering ground too quickly? 
You're all still awake, which is a good sign. <laughs> Number two, angels are many and powerful. Their number. Let's talk about their number. Many scriptures here. Hopefully you can read those. I'll read some of them to you. The chariots of God are ten thousand, tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. Psalm 68, 17. And then a very interesting passage in Daniel, the seventh chapter. The book of Daniel, in case you haven't caught this, I've referred to the book of Daniel many times. Daniel is particularly insightful to the activity in the spirit realm. We, we receive a lot of information in the book of Daniel. And Daniel is talking about the entity that is on the throne. And he refers to God as the Ancient of Days. I like that. The Ancient of Days. And it says, thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Now, this word, um, thousands upon thousands, there's a word that will be used in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 2, in Hebrews where we, the book from which we draw our foundation verse. It speaks about the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels. Hebrews 12, 2. It, it speaks of myriads of angels. The word myriads is an unfathomable number. Myriad equals in Greek unfathomable number. So, and in Revelation 5.11, it continues the theme as to huge amounts of holy angels. Uh, in, it talks about the angels around the throne. So when we get to heaven, when we cross from this realm, pass from this realm into the next, into that dimension, we're not just going to see a few angels scattered around. There are literally, clearly millions of angels. Millions. Because as we multiply these numbers, it, it quickly multiplies into millions and millions of these heavenly beings. So there are clearly many of them. And then they are incredibly powerful. The Bible gives evidence of this over and over again. I haven't given you some of the, <clears throat> some of the scriptures, but some of the scriptures where we have evidence of their power that I have not mentioned because it's not specific, but it's inferred by the situation, are, for example, uh, when they appear to men. Often when an angel brings a message and appears to an individual, when, when that person gets close to the angel, there are many times that the strength just falls right out of their body. And, and we as human beings, how would you describe that? Well, we're wired for 110 and evidently they're 220. Okay? And so you, get, I mean, you just can't plug into, they move in and out of the presence of God. They're able to withstand such power that they can come into the throne room of God. We, we, we have no idea as to, you say, well, that's spiritual power. Ladies and gentlemen, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your body, soul, mind, and spirit. And you are, you are spirits with an earth body, with an earth suit. And your earth suit, your spirit can take more than your earth suit can. Okay. And flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. In other words, our bodies are going to have to be changed. And often when an angel would encounter with a message, that person would begin to lose strength. The angel, again, remember they're able to interact. They're able to communicate. They're able to respond. The angel would reach out and say, be strengthened. Take hold of them and give them strength. Because otherwise they're, oh, they're going out. And then, Wait a minute. Whoa, I got a message to give to you. <laughs> Wake up. And so there's great power, but there's other evidences of that. In Psalm 103, 20, it says, Praise the Lord, you, you his angels, you mighty ones, who do his bidding and obey his word. You mighty ones. The psalmist is very clear. You angels, you mighty ones. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 says, 
This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire, think about that, with his powerful angels. With his powerful angels. They are powerful. I, I, I have a feeling they have to tone it down. I don't know how they do that, but they have to, they, maybe it's a rheostat. I don't know. You guys know what a rheostat is, a, a dimmer. Maybe they have a dimmer and they have to tone things down before they get close to us or before they interact with us. I'm not sure really how that works, but the Bible describes them over and over again as powerful. In, in 2 Kings 19.35, it says, In one night, night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 soldiers. One angel destroyed a whole army in one night, 185,000. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies, exclamation mark, 2 Kings 19.35. That was one angel. There's millions of them. God is not short of power. If, you, if, you're, if you're a little concerned about how this thing with the devil and God's going to work out, you can, that, that's one thing you can take, check off your list, okay? God is all power. They have power. God is all power. God created them. And in fact, it's, this is not a battle between God and the devil. There never has been a battle between God and the devil. Did you know that? The devil is no match for God. The, it, it's a, Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall like lightning. Did you ever see a strike of lightning? From heaven. It was that, that's how much battle there was. The battle is between you, me, the children of God, the church of Jesus Christ, and the devil. The battle isn't between God and the devil. It's between us. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. We're the one that's battling, not God. And that's why God has given us the armor. That's why God has given us all the tools, all the weapons we need so that we can win the battle. It would be wonderful to go into that a little bit if we could. But in this, God wants us to win and God wants us to learn our place because you are created in the image of God. You are not the tail, you are the head, the Bible says. And the Bible says that he will crush Satan under your feet, Romans. The God of peace seems like a contradiction. The God of peace, Paul told the Romans, will soon crush Satan under your foot. And so it is our foot that is to be on top of Satan. God's already defeated him. God is teaching you your place, your authority. He's teaching us our place. One time I remember questioning God, I said, God, you've already, you've taken, the Bible says you led captives in captivity, but you also, it says that you defeated the principalities and powers, they're subject unto you, you now rule and reign over them. Why is it that when we pray, we still have to fight and, and exercise faith and fight our way through instantly? These words popped into my head. I'm teaching you how to reign. Not reign, reign. To rule. I'm teaching you how to rule. I'm teaching you how to reign. I'm teaching you to how to win your own battles, your own victories. Because this isn't the only place you'll ever live. The Bible says that in the, in the new heaven and the new earth, it says, do you not know you will judge angels? Do you not know? Another assumption. Are you not aware of that? See, we are created, as we began in the first lesson, we are created in the image of God. That is a unique position. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, say angels were created in the image of God. Only man. That is an incredible place to be. Now, we're fallen. We are fallen beings. And we are in a struggle. And that's a good place to say amen, but we also are promised victory. And so right now we're in the middle of the already and not yet. 
That's what theologians call this time period. The already and not yet. Jesus has already won the victory. Jesus has already risen from the dead. Jesus is already at the right hand of the Father. He has raised you and I, I up with him. But we see that all things, the Bible says, have not yet been put under his feet. Who's putting these things under his feet? Jesus is through his church, you. So Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He's the head of the body of Christ. And it is the body of Christ that Jesus is working with to defeat the enemy and put all things under his feet. So you and I are in essence a part of an army that God is partnering with teaching us victory and helping us to gain victory and expand the kingdom of heaven. For the gates of hell will not prevail, cannot resist the ongoing onslaught of the church of Jesus Christ. Over and over again, the Bible promises us victory, does it not? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so we get a little picture of this. I've got one more point. I'm at 1009. They can give and transfer strength. We talked about this a little bit. It says in Daniel, the 10th chapter, verse 8, 18, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. So they not only are powerful, but they can transfer strength. They can, they can give strength to whoever. Um, and it says in Luke twenty two forty three, 43, they gave strength to who? Jesus. Jesus needed them to give him strength one time. The Son of God. Very God, very man. He knows he's been touched, the Bible says, with all of our weaknesses. And when he was praying and praying through in the garden, he evidently got so weak that it says an angel appeared and strengthened him, touched him, gave him strength. So he could do what? Keep praying. What did he do right after the angel strengthened him? Interesting point. He didn't get up. He kept praying. Prayer is, let's end with this. Prayer is so important. And it was so important that Jesus, it wasn't important that Jesus jump up and, 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 and get on with the, the call of God to take upon himself the cross. What God sent an angel to do was to strengthen his son when he was in the middle of praying. And he strengthened him not so that he could jump up, but so that he could keep praying until he prayed through. There are some things that are accomplished by prayer and only prayer that will never be accomplished any other way. It is so important that God sent an angel to strengthen him to pray. Your prayers are so important. Our prayers are so important to heaven. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. John Wesley said God does nothing except an answer to prayer. God waits. Jesus, or the scripture says, you have not because you ask not. There's something, if we knew, if we knew, there's the old saying by the individual who said that, that hell trembles at the sight of the weakest saint on their knees. That prayer is powerful. And if Jesus had to pray through, then how much more did, do we have to continue until we have assurance of victory? If you get up from prayer feeling just as defeated as you did when you started to pray, you didn't pray through. You need to pray through until you get up off of your knees feeling different and changed. And walking and saying, all right, circumstances are the same, but I've got victory. God's going to help me. Amen? All right. I went from teaching to preaching. And, on that number where you have Psalm 68 death, that doesn't reference anything about angels. I'm sorry? 
Where you have that number and it says Psalm 6810? Yes. That doesn't represent anything to angels. Okay, I'll have to look into that. Because right now I've got to go get changed to baptize people. Oh, is that the wrong number? Okay, let me look real quickly. We'll get that corrected. Sixty-eight. Yeah. Where A it says number no, Psalm sixty-eight. Seventeen. Seventeen. Sixty-eight. Seventeen. Seventeen. Yes. Good catch. Good catch. Seventeen. I must have been punch drunk when I came in last late last night to write those down. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Keep me on track.